Yeah, my name is Laura. I work for Mozilla. Um, I'm actually filling in for my colleague Michelle. And if Michelle had been here, she would have written a very different talk, uh, mainly because we're different people. So we see things differently, right? Um, so yeah, um, before we actually get started, because I'm going to be talking about participatory practices and participatory methodology, I want you guys to participate right off the bat in the morning. I would like you to find someone in this room that you have not yet met and talk to them for two minutes. And I'm just going to stand here and watch and make sure you do it. <laughs> I know, it's so annoying, right? Participating first thing in the morning? Find someone you haven't met. So, I wonder what you learned about each other in the last, what was that, like three minutes? Can anybody summarize their three minute conversation in one word? Yell it out. Noise. Noise. That's a good one. Yes, it was quite noisy. Anybody else? Expat. Expat, nice. Did you learn something about the person you just talked to that you didn't know? Probably, right? Because you didn't know them, right? So this is something that I do all the time. Not because somebody tells me to, you know, be annoying in the morning and go meet new people or something, but um, I like to see what people are thinking and I like to get to know people even on these like really minimal scales. Like I, I really, you know, when I catch somebody's eye on the street, and this might be a cultural thing, like I'm an American, so when I catch somebody's eye, I have to smile. Um, but if I catch somebody's eye on the street or I like their shoes or I'm interested in them in some way, I'll talk to them and I'll try to connect with them for whatever reason. And I think that the reason that I do this is because I'm really interested in this idea of participating in my own life. I'm interested in what it means as a human being to participate. So we, we spend a lot of time thinking about ourselves, right? Um, and we spend a lot of time thinking about our work and our lives, et cetera. And I'm really interested in this, this connection piece. So it's strange because last week when I was writing this talk, I've never given this talk before, it's a new one, um, a friend of mine, actually not a friend, more, more a colleague, also a friend, uh, I admire him a great deal, he's really awesome, he called me a sociopath, which is <laughs> ridiculous, right? But for one split second, actually longer than a split second, I thought about myself, and I thought about my own perception of self, and I thought, you know, sometimes I really do have a lack of empathy. Um, you know, I'm, I don't know, sometimes I'm pretty antisocial. So, of course, I did what any normal person would do. I went on the internet, and I took a quiz to see if I'm a sociopath, right? Because obviously, that's what you do. And I was thinking about myself, and I thought, okay, I swing the full gambit between extrovert and introvert, depending on the day, the time, the situation. Um, I am brutally honest, but also a very cunning liar, at least I think I am. Uh, I'm, I'm a dork, like a geek, a nerd, but I'm also athletic and sporty. I, I am basically a conundrum onto myself. I don't understand myself. I'm so complicated. I have all of these emotions. I'm, you know, a person. Uh, and so I, I took this quiz because I thought, wouldn't it be great if there were one word that we could use to sum up everything that we are? Like one word. And of course, sociopath is in no way the word for me. Um, and I'm not sure what that, what that word would be anyways. But what, as a side note, by the way, if you're taking a quiz to find out if you're a sociopath, you're definitely not a sociopath. But that's, you know, beside the point. Um, so I, you know, I was thinking of the range of human emotion that I have, and this wheel doesn't even begin to cover it, right? We are complicated beings, and we all have different thoughts, and we have different needs, and the way that we participate in life is really part of that, right? It's part of what we think we need and how we feel. So here's the thing. Our perceptions of self and our perceptions of the world around us are completely based, largely, maybe not completely, largely based on cultural and societal norms, right? If you're wearing a, there's not a lot of blue shirts. If you're wearing a blue shirt, raise your hand. I'm wearing a blue shirt, right? Okay. If you're wearing a black shirt, go like this. Ah! <laughs> right, cultural and societal norms, right? We are 
emotions, our actions, are influenced by what we think is socially correct, you know, normal in some, some capacity. We think that the speaker is notable. We think the CEO has vision. We think the teacher is an expert. We think that the, the police have authority, right? But all of this is just a perception. And that perception, because of the internet, is starting to change. Because with the web, we're starting to connect with people who don't share that same cultural and societal background as we do, right? And so we are starting to kind of push against what it actually means to be normal. And I think that that kind of understanding, that, that connection that, that we're doing via the internet is, is a way that you can start to think about what participation actually means, right? Because participating means that you are open to all of those different cultural and societal norms and that you are willing to actually give people the time of day when it comes to this. And I feel like I'm using a lot of idioms at the moment. Um, but what I mean is, if you can respect that somebody has a different norm than you do, then you can invite them to participate and you can participate with them without actually you know, butting heads or having some sort of conflict, right? So when you think about participatory practices, what participation means to us, to individuals, is influenced by our norms. And we don't have to pay attention to that. Just because somebody else thinks it's true doesn't doesn't make it so, right? You get to make your own decisions, you're complex, you get to have your own emotions, and you get to think about how you wanna participate in the world. And so when people think of participatory practices or they think about what that means, a lot of times people think that it's just gonna be this chaotic free-for-all where nothing gets done and you know, there's no order at all. But here's the thing, learning is not passive, right? Participation is not passive. They're both active things, and participatory practice does not mean formless. It doesn't, it might look chaotic, but it doesn't mean that it is, right? So I'm going to show you the Mozilla story. Um, I'll show this first, and then I'll tell you why I like this video. In the beginning, the web was simple, connected, open, safe. Designed as a force for good, it would become something far greater. A living, breathing ecosystem in service of humanity. A public resource for innovation and opportunity. A place to build your dreams. But in those early days, like any ecosystem, the web needed nurturing. As it grew, users faced new challenges. Pop-ups. Viruses. A lack of choice. You've got mail. Walled gardens of content. The web was fraying, it was slow, complicated, scary. Users began to ask, is this it? Or could the web be something better? A small group of people, coders, designers, idealists, believed it could. They had an audacious idea that a tiny nonprofit and a global community could build something better and force new ideas and innovation onto the web. They called it the Mozilla Project. They began by making a new kind of web browser, what we know today as Firefox, and they made it a nonprofit so it would always put the people who use the web first. More than software, it was a platform that anyone could use to build on their ideas. The nuisances diminished. The foundations of the web we know today began to appear. Now, the web is a place where you can build almost anything you imagine. Mozilla and Firefox exist to help people everywhere seize this opportunity and to stand up for users in a world where choice and control are too often at risk. But what if Firefox was just the beginning? What if it was part of something bigger? From user privacy to Firefox mobile to apps and identity, we're pushing the boundaries of the web every day. And we're going beyond software. We're helping to build a generation of web makers. We believe the web is a place where anyone can come to build their dreams. It's why we make Firefox. It's why tens of thousands of volunteers help build our products. It's why hundreds of millions around the world use our software. But most importantly, it's why we always put you first. 
and stand up to those who don't. Millions know us for Mozilla Firefox, but we're about so much more. We're a non-profit fighting to protect the web we all love. Join us. We need your support. Make a donation today. video is because it shows that Mozilla as an open source project is actually pretty focused on participation. Now we focus that in the direction of the web, um, but because I believe that the web is actually a collection of basically human knowledge or most of it, um, it's, really, it's really about participating in life for me. Um, so Mozilla, Mozilla has thousands and thousands of volunteers that participate in the Mozilla project because they believe in what Mozilla stands for. And what Mozilla stands for is openness and innovation on in the web. Um, we're a community, right? And, and I like that that video shows how far participation can go. Like it can become something that is, you participate in a community and you become a global project that stands for something. A big part of my job at Mozilla is to shift people's understandings of cultural and societal norms and to shift the dynamics in, in different roles that we have in our society. So I spend a lot of time helping students become teachers or you know, designers become developers or whatever it is that somebody is looking to learn and do, I help them see it from a different perspective so that they don't have to feel like a beginner and so that they can actually take the agency that they need to start on a path um, that, that is leading them to lifelong learning, right? Um, so in the con connected learning landscape, in the connectivist landscape, we really believe, this is something that Mozilla believes in, this model, um, we really believe that starting from a place of interest as opposed to explaining to people what it is they're supposed to be interested in, um, is a better way to connect people, it's a better way to give people agency, and it's all around a better way to think about how you can participate in a particular project or community. Um, so for me, participatory is the difference between a lecture and a conversation, right? Um, it's, it, it's a difference between passive and active for me. So, what we're trying to do at Mozilla is really facilitate conversations. So if you take a deeper look into the Mozilla community, what you're going to find is not just Firefox or Webmaker or Thunderbird or any of our software products. You're going to find a very, very diverse group of people who are doing all kinds of things, like unbelievable things. They're having unbelievable com believable conversations that sometimes don't even feel like they have anything to do with the web. But they do, because the web is this collection of knowledge. So when I am thinking about how we can actually scale participatory methodology, because remember I said it's really chaotic and people are like, oh, I can do that with a couple of people, but what if there are hundreds and thousands of, you know, hundreds or thousands of people in the room? That's just chaos, I don't know how to do it. Um, but at Mozilla, we've actually shown that it is possible to scale participatory practice in a way that is effective for people, it respects their intellects, respects their skills, um, and we've actually been doing it for five years now. It's called MozFest. Um, this is our, our biggest public-facing event, and, and we really aim to honor the people who come there. So the Mozilla Festival happens once a year. This year is the fifth year. It's in London. If you want to come, mozillafestival.org. Uh, don't worry, I have an etherpad with tons of links for you guys. Um, and what it is, is it's 10 floors of crazy organized chaos. It, it's amazing. Um, it is, basically what we do is we invite people from all different walks of life. We have filmmakers, we have technologists, we have designers, we have artists, we have scientists, we have journalists. Uh, we have all of these different minds. And we throw them all in a building for a weekend and then we shake it and we try to see what's gonna happen. So we have nine different tracks 
um, that people, that we sort of organize the content into. Uh, and then the community, they submit proposals and we see which kind of proposals really are thinking about participatory methodology or what do they want to make and we work with those people to try to help them bring something to the festival that is new, exciting, interesting and involves other people. We try to help people collaborate there. Um, we ask ourselves every step of the way as we're organizing the festival and as we're creating, you know, helping people create their content, we ask ourselves every step of the way, is this valuable? And according to MozFest attendees, it is. Here's another video. <laughs> So the Mozilla Festival is Mozilla's largest public-facing event. We have about 1,500 participants here in our lab slash classroom where we're celebrating all the stuff we've been doing around making and teaching the web over the last year and trying to build the future of what we think the web should be in the coming years. The heart of Mozilla is us. The heart of Mozilla is the global community of people who share a common mission. MozFest has, for, for four years going now, just been a really great kind of center point to bring together a lot of people that are interested in talking about coding and journalism and, and open data and, and all kinds of stuff. MozFest is filled with people who have a common cause. That cause is building a web that is open, a web that is free, a web that is ours. And, you know, they're coming here and they're actually rolling up their sleeves and they're making it. This idea of understanding tech and being able to kind of include it in everyday life is a really important and relevant thing in all kinds of places. Open news, open data, building and teaching the web, privacy, making the web physical. There's a range of spaces where participants are invited to go and throw down hard. Make something, try something, build something, teach something. The idea is to prototype that which does not exist on Friday night, but which shall exist by Sunday evening. MozFest is not about just talking about the future of the web, it's actually about building the future of the web. So it's kind of a, a gathering of the tribes for all of the people who want to make the web something that people can produce and not just consume. We've got the biggest, baddest badges lab we've ever had. They're making badges, they're helping people here establish their own badges to grant to one another. Everyone here is a teacher and a learner, and that's part of the experience that makes MozFest so much fun and so chaotic. It was an amazing festival, there's so much information here, and so many cool people doing amazing things. I, I listened to the guy talk about it at the beginning and be like, Seriously, we want everyone making everything, we want everyone in small groups, and I was like, yeah, right, that's not going to happen, and it did. I was very impressed. You actually met to, uh, get to meet so many really awesome people under the same roof. It's the most interesting, coolest thing I've done all year. talking at the beginning and I was like, yeah, right, whatever. Um, because that's something that I come up on quite a lot in my job, um, is listening to people tell me that that's you know, not gonna work or that's a stupid idea or what are you talking about or whatever. Um, but this idea of how participation can empower people is something that I actually learned about at the very first Mozilla Festival five years ago. Um, at the time, I had no idea that Mozilla was a nonprofit. Mozilla made Firefox. They compete with Google. They are like Apple and Amazon and every other tech company. That's what I thought. Um, I went there for my own selfish gain. I had a failing startup and I um, applied to the science fair because Mozilla was going to give me money to show my startup to people. And I thought that maybe I could save it. Totally didn't. It died. Um, and, you know, I went there, I had no idea about the open community, like I knew about open source, yeah, whatever, you know, you guys make it so that people can copy and paste your code. Uh, but I didn't really understand anything about this world. Five years later, I'm an evangelist for this world, so that kind of says something. But the Mozilla Festival, what I found there, what grabbed me was somebody came up to me and gave me agency. They were like, you can do anything you want in the world. We're a community of people that care about the web and we want to collaborate and let's do this stuff together. And they, they handed it to me like, what's your opinion? What do you think? Why, you know, why are you here? Cool startup, etc. People like the startup. It still died, but that's a whole other story. Um, 
But this agency that I was given was something that completely changed my life. It changed my life. I ditched the startup. I started uh, contributing to Mozilla as a volunteer. I did that for about a year and a half before the executive director was basically like, please, will you come work for us now? And I was like, okay, sure. You want to pay me to do what I'm doing for free? That's awesome. Um, and, you know, but the thing that I got was agency. I found a community of people that was interested in who I am as a person and asking me to collaborate and to participate. Um, and I felt comfortable doing it, right? So the last couple of years, the last couple of years at the Mozilla Festival, I've been what's called a space wrangler. And our job as a space wrangler is to give that agency to other people. Our job is to invite people in, encourage people to try, encourage people to collaborate, to talk to each other, to make. We design the content around a particular space, um, and our job is really to bring people in. Now, there are 1,500 people that come to the Mozilla Festival, so naturally, nine space wranglers can't actually talk to all 1,500 people. But what we can do is mentor people who already have agency to use that agency to help give agency to other people. So participatory practice, in my opinion, is a lot about emotion and agency and encouragement and being open to the idea that just because somebody you know, is new or different in some way doesn't mean that they don't have something really valuable to give. Um, so last year at the Mozilla Festival, uh, I've been space wrangling for a couple of years and uh, I you know, learned some things about how to design an entire floor that 1,500 people can can walk through and participate in. And I was so exhausted after the 2012 Mozilla Festival that I decided that I wanted to try self-service participatory methods. I had no idea what that mean, meant. But basically what I wanted to do was I wanted to find a way that I could empower people without actually having to empower them, if you know what I mean. Like self-service empowerment. Um, and so, I got this idea for a giant scrum board. So if you don't know what a scrum board is, scrum is a method in software development where you basically put a bunch of tasks on a board and then a team of people kind of move them over based on a timeline. And actually, um, a real scrum is pretty complicated and they have actual you know, people that run the scrum board. Um, so I had this idea for a kind of scrum board and this is what it looked like um, about halfway through the festival. Um, so basically, on the left, there's a to make column, and within that column was a bunch of colored cards. I came up with a color coding system because I didn't uh, know how else to actually design all of this content. Um, people could take a card off the wall, move it into making, and then the color code would say to anybody who came to look at it, um, this person is making this red card, the red section is over there, go find them, that's what they're working on. Uh, and then once things were done, then it got moved over into the made section. Um, so of course, I couldn't do this this much alone because what actually had to happen was we had to get things into a place, the proposals that people had sent in, we had to get them into a place where somebody could walk up, see a card, take it, and do it without another person being there. Um, and this was pretty complicated, actually, because a lot of people, going back to those cultural and societal norms, a lot of people think that when they propose something to a conference, it is a talk, right? Or it is them showing their piece of software and workshop is just, you know, everybody has a laptop and you show the thing. Um, so what we actually had to do, I worked with a colleague of mine and we went through all of these hundreds of proposals that had come into our track and we read through them and we asked ourselves, what does this person really want to do? How can they do that with other people? And what is the end product going to be? So for example, we had someone um, submit a, a proposal. They wanted to educate people about gender biasm in, on the web and in media, which is a pretty big idea. But one of the things that I'm pretty good at is actually breaking complicated ideas into very small pieces and parts. So uh, with her proposal, we basically worked with her and we said, okay, you wanna educate people about this, maybe what you should do is make a piece of curriculum that actually shows somebody how to teach the concept of gender biasm using Remix, using the web. Um, 
So we have the idea, curriculum for gender bias in media. Then we had to break that down further, right? Because you don't just put that on the wall and that doesn't empower anybody because they're like, where do I start? What do I do? Um, so we broke that down into really discrete tasks like define learning objectives for curriculum on gender bias. Uh, define reflective questions. And these all kind of manifested in different cards, right? So this is just one example. We had other ones. Like we had a guy who wanted to do a public service announcement about DRM, digital rights management. So we worked with him to say, okay, well, what is a public service announcement? How can we break that down? And we broke down all of these different proposals to be a project of some sort. And then we wrote down all of the discrete tasks, discrete tasks onto these little cards. And we stuck them in the wall in this crazy rainbow. And then we defined sections throughout the festival where people would be working on one theme or another. So for example, the gender biasm, that was in a theme a sort of a sub-track to our track uh, that was called uh, Empowering Diverse audi Audiences. And then we also had like, you know, uh, creating things for emergency and conflict zones and, and a bunch of other sort of main topics. So, I was terrified. <laughs> I was terrified. Um, we worked with hundreds of people. Um, actually, I brought up the etherpad that we use. This is um, the etherpad that we use to work with all of these different people to break down all of their tasks. So you can see how completely ridiculous it is. Uh, and we had over 100 people that were participating in this scrum in some way. And there were two of us that were working with them to sort of get them to create their proposals in the vision that we thought would work with this with the scrum board. Um, and I was terrified because I had never done this before and I was pretty sure it was gonna fail because we put so much work in. I was just like, well, if you put that much work in, it's probably gonna fail. Um, but it didn't, of course it didn't because it was awesome and it was well organized. But what actually happened was amazing. Like people came through and they were attracted to this wall of color and they walked up and they found cards that they were interested in and if it was already in the making uh, in the making column, they went over to that colored section and they started talking to people, they started collaborating with each other. It was as if the, the sheer physical act of translating all of these ideas into things that people could do and sticking them on the wall gave people the agency they needed to get started, right? They didn't. They didn't have to be brave if they didn't want to because the card was already there, but none of these cards could have been completed by a robot. Humans had to use their human in order to make the thing on the card. And make we did. Uh, we made over 150 different things, handbooks and curriculum and posters and tiny little pieces of software. We made things for all of these different categories, things that were just fun, remixes, mashups. Um, we, we made plans to take this work further and go into the future. Just tons and tons of stuff. I think that design constraints are really, really important if you're thinking about uh, participatory practice because people People can't just go from nothing. They need, they, need, they need to feel comfortable in what they're starting. And so what we did at the Mozilla Festival with, with the design constraints was actually perfect because we didn't dictate what people had to do. We just put things in a way that they could do something if they wanted to, but they could go further. You know, but they didn't have to start from, from, from scratch. Um, I was actually thinking that what we should do, I think we have about a half an hour left, right? Is that right? I was actually thinking that maybe what we should do is kind of skip the rest of the talk or I'll just like blaze through the slides and then actually practice some participatory methods because this is not one. <laughs> and, and that guy's bored, so I thought... You're talking too much. I'm talking too much. Yeah, all right, so... How about, how about I do this? Um, I will say that um, we all need accolades and we are all afraid of being human um, because that's just something that for whatever reason that we've been taught. 
Uh, I'm, I'm going through really fast now because I'd really much rather do the participatory stuff. Um, we are groomed to understand hierarchies, authorities, seniorities. Uh, from the moment we're toddlers on into life, we are groomed to participate in the world in this way, in this way that we've been taught is normal and that we understand. Um, but I think that that is a bunch of hooey, actually. I think that we get to decide how we participate in life. Um, and that having that agency and taking that control is actually really important, and it's important to give that on. So blaze through that slide. Um, here's a bunch of links um, to stuff that I've talked about, and now I actually would really rather do some participatory things. <laughs>